Dear colleague, I will in this lecture discuss the use of multiple targets in DBS, and this is more of an overview and perhaps of limited practical value, but I hope that you might find it of some interest. And the first thing we can conclude is that there is nothing new with multiple targets in stereotactic neurosurgery. On the contrary, Stereotactic neurosurgery was building on the experience from large open procedures, and it must from the beginning have been natural to contemplate to make the small stereotactic lesions in more than one aspect of the larger structures targeted in the open interventions, and we can see this in psychosurgery, and perhaps most clearly in the limbic leucotomy, combining the dorsal cingulotomy and tractotomy, but also in movement disorders where the very first procedure was a combination of two lesions, one in the dorsal medial nucleus of the thalamus and one in the pallidum. And multiple targets were frequently used in various combinations. Sometimes the trajectories were planned so as to allow for the evaluation of multiple targets as seen here with the trajectory for the ventrolateral thalamus and into the GPI, and at other times multiple trajectories were used. Here we see an example of Mundinger's algorithm in cerebral palsy, where he would start in the zona inserta, and then add lesions in the pulvinar, if not satisfactory, and then in the VO. He would then wait at least one week before considering to add a lesion in the dentate nucleus, and if necessary, in other structures. But the most common combination was then, as now, between thalamic and subthalamic structures. The introduction of the ventrolateral thalamotomy for tremor naturally resulted in an exploration of the underlying subthalamic area. And during the following years, thousands of patients were operated with subthalamotomies in the PSA, with or without thalamotomies. And the same was the case with early DBS with externalized electrodes. Many of the pioneers would use multiple electrodes and targets, both in movement disorders and psychiatric disorders. And we can here especially mention Robert Heath, who implanted up to 29 electrodes in various targets. And Bechtereva, who used to implant bundles of many electrodes into different structures for both Parkinson's disease and OCD. So, multiple targets were commonly used for lesions and early experimental DBS, but became uncommon with modern DBS. And the explanation is probably quite simple. To make multiple lesions is simple, and to implant multiple electrodes with one contact for evaluation is rather simple. But to implant multiple quadripolar electrodes for chronical use, where each electrode needed a separate extension cable and a separate IPG, is much more complex and resource demanding. For practical reasons, multiple targeting was from then on limited to the targets which could be encompassed by a single electrode, or in a few studies, to a total of four electrodes after the introduction of newer IPGs capable of supporting two electrodes each. However, we have lately also seen the development of the hardware, which should be beneficial regarding multiple targets, such as multiple source IPGs with individual control of the contacts, as well as electrodes with more contacts and directional steering of the current. So, let us look at the current situation regarding multiple targets in DBS. And for practical reasons, it is important to differentiate between targets that can be reached with one single electrode and those necessitating multiple electrodes. We have quite a few of these aligned targets, some only suggested and other commonly used. With aligned targets, the targeting will become slightly more complicated with more focus on the trajectory, but the surgery is not more complicated or more expensive, and there should not be an increased risk for complications. The programming might become more complicated, but this is not the case for the most commonly used combinations. So, let's look at a few examples. And if we start with the area of the internal capsule in psychiatric disorders, then we have several different targets. But patients with accumbens or BNST DBS will have their highest contacts in the internal capsule. And some will also try to reach the medial forebrain bundle here on its way through the internal capsule. 
In movement disorders, when performing GPI DBS, the highest contact will typically end up in the GP, and these two structures were sometimes combined during the lesional era. Some beneficial effects have been reported of GP DBS regarding bradykinesia and freezing of gait, but as far as I know, it is never targeted intentionally together. If we instead advance the electrode further down, we might combine GPI with DBS of the nucleus basalis of Maynard, however with a rather anterior location in the GPI. The idea is that this could be beneficial regarding dementia, but the results have not been very promising. When performing STN DBS, the deepest contact might end up in the nigra, and some beneficial effects of stimulation have been seen regarding especially freezing of gait, and Valderiola has a study where he is intentionally targeting both the STN and nigra, and stimulating both of them with an octopolar electrode and stimulating the different targets simultaneously with both low and high frequency stimulation with some reported benefits. Regarding the target in the STN, we are not quite sure where this is, but it seems clear that some patients receive the best effect at its upper border or above the STN in the anterior part of the zona inserta. However, Sometimes an electrode deviating in the typical posteromedial direction will end up the deepest contact in the caudal zona inserta, and this will usually provide an excellent effect on the tremor component. And this group has adapted the trajectory and are now targeting both the STN and the caudal zona inserta. This is feasible, but I'm not completely convinced that it is optimal. Then it is easier and more natural to combine the PSA or the zona inserta, as it is also called, with the VIM, since even when only the VIM is targeted, many or even most patients have the best effect in the PSA, and by simply advancing the electrode deeper down from the VIM, we will often end up fairly well placed in the PSA. And in reality, these two targets might be seen more as different aspects of a continuum, since we are probably achieving the effect from simulation of the cerebellothalamic fibers at the level of the uh, colosone inserta, or at the level of the VIM. And it is possible to combine the atlas target in the VIM with a visual target in the PSA in about 9 patients out of 10. And it is then an advantage to have an entry point slightly behind the coronal suture or in the middle of it. And here we have a case where the trajectory for the VIM in blue is coinciding nicely with the trajectory for the PSA in red. If you would like to have more information on how to combine these targets from a practical point of view, then you will find all the details in these two lectures on the website. But an important question is, of course, if we should combine these targets. We now have two randomized trials with one electrode for both these targets, demonstrating a better effect in the zona inserta. I started using this target in 2004, and we have demonstrated its efficiency in a number of studies. And we have recently presented a 10-year outcome, demonstrating a very stable effect and also a low and non-increasing energy consumption. And a major advantage is that visualization of the PSA on MRI makes a sleep surgery for essential tremor possible. And we have analyzed 86 patients and found that a sleep surgery is not inferior to a wake surgery regarding the outcome, while it is much faster and presumably much more convenient both for the patient and for the surgeon. Thus, I believe that it would, for many now using VIM DBS, be beneficial to combine this target with the PSA. The non-aligned targets necessitating multiple electrodes is, however, a different story. Regarding these non-aligned targets, all the structures can be combined by using two different leads, but the targeting is slightly more complicated and the programming often becomes much more complicated and time-consuming. How it is done is discussed in this lecture, and it is clear that the surgery becomes significantly more complicated and longer, and of course more expensive, and there must be an increased risk for complications. Thus, one needs good reason to implant multiple non-aligned targets. 
And as I see it, there are mainly three situations when it might be indicated with the second electrode. You might use it when you don't know which target to choose, like in this patient with unclear diagnosis with dystonic symptoms and tremor implanted both in the PSI and GPI. To combine the GPI and the VIM or PSA is probably the most common combination of non-aligned targets and used for patients with dystonic tremor. And this combination is rather simple to manage since both the symptoms and the effects of stimulation in the two targets are quite distinct and stimulation of both targets will often be beneficial. But this is not as true for all indications and combinations. Secondly, sometimes we might try another target if the first was not successful, and this will often be helpful, as in these cases with combinations of the VIM and PSA, the VIM and GPI, and the STN and the GPI respectively. I have no idea how common it might be to use non-aligned targets for DBS. Most centers will probably never use it, I use it now and then, and some will use it quite frequently, as seen as this example. And thirdly, there are a number of studies combining and comparing different targets in this manner. And I have myself used it with the STN and PSA for essential tremor, and with the BNST and middle forebrain bundle in depression and anxiety. Others have used it for comparison of the GPI and STN, PPN and STN, etc. etc. However, I have the impression that while this methodology is good for comparing different targets, there is not a single study that with much enthusiasm advocates the combination of the targets in order to improve the effect. It is true that an improved effect is sometimes seen by adding and stimulating two targets, but this seems not to be deemed of sufficient value to make up for the disadvantages with multiple electrodes as previously mentioned. But perhaps this is because we are not using this technique uh, in the right way. Perhaps we are using it in a too simple manner and the advantages would be unlocked with a more advanced approach. Samir Shet and his group have perhaps taken this to its logical conclusion by trying to tailor the stimulation to the individual patient's brain. They implanted four electrodes for stimulation in the subsingulate gyrus and in the area of the internal capsule and a further ten electrodes for recording. They then stimulated and uh, recorded the patient's brain for 9 days through 180 contacts and decided which pattern of brain activity was most desirable concerning the patient's condition, and then decided which stimulation parameters would create this pattern of brain activity. And finally, they used this for chronic stimulation, which resulted in a remission of symptoms after 18 weeks. But at least to me, this seems awfully complicated. If we could control every single neuron in the brain, then we would have complete control over the brain. And from a theoretical point of view, it is natural to assume that we will in general increase our control with the number of targets that we can affect with DBS. But I believe that from a practical point of view, multiple leads are still too much of a problem to become commonly used and when used, it is mostly used for evaluation rather than for simultaneous stimulation. The programming is today limited by our feeble minds, and this is still to a large extent a response-guided process. In our own experience, we can manage four electrodes in two different targets, but it takes time and is challenging, and not anything that could be managed as a standard with today's technology. Thus, multiple targets in DBS might be a good idea, but it will probably never become common unless we can get some help with the automatization of the programming. So, to conclude, multiple aligned targets are frequently used today, especially thalamic subthalamic and combinations in the internal capsule area. Non-aligned targets are quite seldom used and when used, they are used mainly for the evaluation of different targets, while simultaneous chronic stimulation of different targets is quite rare, mainly with the exception of the VIM and the GPI. Chronic stimulation of multiple targets hold great potential 
from a theoretical point of view. And the limitations today are not mainly related to the hardware, even if this could be further optimized. But to realize the potential, an automatization of the evaluation and programming is probably necessary. So this was a few of my personal thoughts on multiple targets and if you found it of interest then you will find more detailed information in the suggested lectures on the website. Thank you for your attention.